All right. Uh, yeah, there we go. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, Baylina Hicks. Let me just see how many people we've got in here. Um, I am a queer writer of color living in San Marcos, Texas. I have been doing poetry. And when I say doing poetry, I mean, I've been writing since 2003. Um, started slamming in 2003 in the Austin Poetry Slam. And um, life happens. And as an artist, you grow. I started going to grad school sometime in, how do I make this into like a big old, I wanna see everybody's faces. There we go, there we go. Um, started grad school at Texas State University, left the program because it did not support people of color like me. Um, went to another program, graduated from Sierra Nevada University with my MFA in creative writing. Uh, my first book is Hoodwitch and it is available everywhere. Um, I don't think today is too much about uh, all the things that I'm doing. I think the first thing I want to do is acknowledge um, the protests that are happening right now uh, and all the people who don't have the space or the time to be online for something like a workshop who are in the streets and doing really great work um, and also space for the people who are being put in harm's way by people who don't care about this movement who just want to see terror. Um, it has been personally very emotional a uh, couple of days. And so not everything is pretty for this workshop, right? I see we've got, it looks like a total of seven of us in here, which is awesome um, because I, I expected it to be a little bit smaller. That way we can have more time to talk about the poems and discuss everything um, and have a real conversation, which is hard to do when there's 8 million people, uh, so that's good. First thing I would like to do is for everyone to share their name, their pronouns, one of their favorite books of poetry, all right? So um, my name is Felita Hicks, my pronouns are she, her, they, and my favorite book of poems off the top of my head is Eyes Vice, which is actually kind of like a um, anthology of poems from I, but Eyes Vice is one of my favorite books. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, the next thing I would like to do is just set some community agreements. Everybody has this mute button, which is super, um, actually it's super, it's, it's kind of intuitive just a little bit, not all the way intuitive, but a little intuitive um, for at least one of my favorite community agreements, which is take space, make space, um, right? Because you have the option and the choice to like turn your speaker on or off um, and step away when you need to. Um, so I think that's one of the things I'd like to offer to this group that I'm hoping we can all agree that, you know, if you need to take some space and you need to say something um, because either you agree or you disagree or you have a, some sort of varying opinion to something, uh, I want you to be able to do that. Um, and I want us as a group to agree that if we need to make space for someone else's um, varying opinion that we can do that without it being an issue, right? Um, so do you think we can put take space, make space as a community agreement? I'm seeing head nods. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Yeah, let's not judge the typing abilities here. We're, we're running on about three hours of sleep. Um, <laughs> Uh, the next one I'd like to uh, say is jargon giraffe, right? It sounds really super goofy. I'm pretty sure that whoever created jargon giraffe like teaches in elementary school um, because I don't know how you would think of it. This is the jargon giraffe, right? I can see almost everyone's, um, I can see almost everyone's like video here. Uh, the point of the jargon giraffe is if at any point I'm using a term that's unfamiliar to you, right? If I say juxtaposition and you're like, I think I know what you're talking about, I'm not entirely sure. Can you just clarify that for me a little bit? We'll do this number here, right? If I am talking and I continue to talk, yeah. If I continue to talk and I just like am not paying attention um, to, to your hands going up, I am going to try to pay attention to what's happening here in the chat. And so I'll keep this open and you can just put a star next to a word, right? So 
So it's like, hey, I still don't know what the heck you're talking about. I'm just going to go ahead and put that in there. You can also privately send me a message um, and I will see it as well, right? So those are two options that we can do. Um, and this is, I, I, it's a community agreement because what I'm asking is that if someone doesn't know a word, we're not going to judge them for not knowing that word. Right. And we're not going to make them feel less than for not knowing that word or understanding that reference. Not everybody has read the same books. Not everybody comes from the same educational background. Not everybody comes from the same, um, you know, economical background. Like if I say something that doesn't make sense, <laughs> let me know. Because that also helps me be better at my job. Right. So can we agree to jargon giraffe? Awesome. And now that I have taken some space, does anyone else want to take some space and suggest a community agreement? You guys are like, no, let's get to the poems. Yeah? No other community agreements? I have some, Faye, oh. if that's cool. Yeah. Um, Maybe let's like make sure that we're not making generalizations about like entire groups of people, use I statements, speak from your own experience, all of those things. Um, but if that was like shorter, it would probably just be like make I statements. <laughs> yeah. Can we all get to that? All right. Um, also, I guess just like if you want to put your pronouns in your um, name or whatever, that's definitely um, encouraged. If you don't know how to do that, it's like three little dots next to your name. And I mean, next to your face on the screen. And then it should have like rename if you want to do that. But it's not like, you know, um, required because I like definitely acknowledge, you know, folks that may not want to share that information. Um, also just like want to put into the space that um, I didn't do a land acknowledgement when we first started, that's my bad, um, but we're all coming from different kind of parts, but I'm personally on a Tukwa and Comanche land. Um, I wanna acknowledge that um, all land is stolen in the US, all land is looted, so let's just like not, if we're talking in the context of protests as well, like just take that, um, Take that knowledge and do with it what you will but like everything is is stolen so yeah um something that would make me feel safer in this space is if people would make an effort like a an effort to refrain from ableist language um and you know i'm not gonna just like be super mad if somebody slips up um or if they don't know but just like thinking about the words you're using and considering um, considering different groups of people in general, but also like considering disabled people and like how different terms might affect different groups of people in that way. Thank you. And that's, a, that's one that I can admit that even I am working on all the time. Even though I'm neurodivergent, I still have a hard time with, you know, trying to restructure the way I think about the way I talk about things. Yeah. Um, so can we all agree to land acknowledgements? And can we all agree to respect pronouns and make an effort to refrain from ableist language? Anyone else have any ideas? Because these are great. I dropped this in the chat, but um, I would like to ask people to not play devil's advocate because I don't think it's generally necessary or helpful um, to any conversation. Um, you can like get your point across without like advocating for sides that don't need advocates. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So can we all agree to the devil's advocate? I think that that was pretty clearly explained what that means. Yeah? All right. Um, and 
I know that this is something that's really hard, um, but that's something like if you go into another space, that's something I want to encourage. Um, language justice just means that if it's possible to have someone do interpretation, uh, whether that be for another language or that um, be for sign language or something to, to that degree, uh, having options. Um, sometimes that really just means also economic justice, being able to afford the services and time of someone else. Uh, who is an expert in that. Um, but for future, I think if you go into another space, suggesting it never hurts. Um, I suggest it all the time. I was like, in case you forgot, next time, please put this on the list of things. Can I put it here for you guys? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Now let's go ahead and I, I put 20 minutes for your introductions because I wanted us to have this space and this time to kind of get to know each other a little bit. Um, I appreciate that we, yeah. And KB is explaining that uh, we didn't have it today because it was only $240 to reserve. Um, but if you have leads for grants for these resources, let them know, right? We don't wanna just ask um, people, especially when it comes that a lot of people who work in language justice are people of color. We don't wanna keep asking them to donate their time. They've got families and bills and other things they need to get paid. So let's find some money to get them that. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and um, kind of move on to the next phase since we have a little bit of that covered. Looks like we might actually be on time, yay. Um, I'm gonna go into the craft talk. And this is a lot of me talking at you, but there is a Q&A portion. So don't, um, don't feel like you're not gonna have a chance to feedback. Um, if you really wanna interject while I'm saying something, please feel free to do so. Uh, but at this point, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what the climate crisis, what the climate crisis looks like um, for people who are in the carceral system for people who, and I put sensuality and not sexuality, and I'll explain why I did that, um, and artistry. Um, when it comes to the climate crisis, for a lot of people, um, at least in my experience, it can feel like it's not always at the forefront of the conversation. It feels like something that's not as immediate for me because the only time I'm thinking about it is when I go outside and it's October and it's 105 degrees, right? I love October, it's my birthday month. And I would like to be able to celebrate with like, you know, falling leaves and wearing my sweaters and, you know, wearing my little scarves and all those things. Um, but unless I see something directly impacting me, it's hard to know that it's impacting others on a regular basis all the time. Um, I wasn't able to pull up and I'm, I'm going to talk about it and then I'll put all the links in this document that you guys will have available to you later. Uh, I just didn't have time to get it to you this morning. <laughs> um, impact on the carceral system. There are people who are coming over from places like Mexico and other locations and they're moving to the U.S. simply because their crops are no longer, you know, coming to fruit to fruition. It's not necessarily about, oh, I just want to leave this place. There are a lot of people who are not experiencing um, violence directly, who are migrating from Mexico into the US, but they're farmers and there's not enough water, which means they're not able to make the crops. And when they're not able to make the crops, they're not able to um, produce goods to sell to support themselves and their families. And so they're literally coming across the border. And what happens is that they end up inside of a detention center, right? Now they're in a cage. And again, not everyone's story about detention centers are the same. I spoke with several um, directly impacted people who have spent years inside of detention centers. One of them is, um, I was going to call him a young man. He's not a young man. He's older. He's like 75. Um, <laughs> there was a man, um, and that, that is his pronoun. Uh, there was a man who was a professor in Mexico and had spent most of his life, you know, building up an educational career there, but the rest of his family were working on farms, and when it came time to, like, you know, 
nothing's growing, nothing's working here. We're not able to support our family. His job wasn't paying him enough to support like, you know, 20 people. So um, they tried to come over and he ended up in a detention center for, I think he said five years before being released. Um, and now he advocates for people who are in detention centers due to migration, due to the climate. Like it's, there are very real examples of um, how the weather is impacting people's movements throughout the world. Um, we also have a lot of people who are in prisons and who are in jails who are dying due to heat exhaustion, uh, who are dying due to a lack of air and water. And when you're stuck inside of a, it's not even, it's just a cement building. It's not always a brick building. It's not always like, you know, a nice air conditioned facility. Hayes County, which is where I spent time in jail, has air conditioning. And so it was cold most of the time. But I was in a space that allowed for air conditioning. There are people who are very much at risk of being stuck inside of the jails without any sort of, um, what do you call the things in between the wall? The outside and the inside insulation. The, the vents or the. No, it's it's the insulation in the walls. Oh. Um, I want to say it was Detroit, and again, I'm going to pull up the links for these things. I just wasn't able to attach them very quickly before we got on the call. Um, I believe in Detroit there was riots inside of the jail and inside of the prison because it was so cold that people were kind of freezing. And you could see people putting flags outside of the um, windows. You could see people shouting from the facility, we need, we need some sort of heat in here. People are dying in here. Um, and we don't think about how the weather is affecting them, right? When we talk about climate change, we think of, and I say we, when I think of climate change, my mind first goes to, um, I'm sorry, guys. What's the young woman's name who is a teenager that is being like the face of climate change right now? Greta Thunberg. Thank you. Yes. I think of Greta Thunberg, right? I don't necessarily think of brown faces who are talking about how the weather is affecting them. I don't necessarily think of uh, adults who are being affected by it in the city of Chicago are in the city of New York. Um, I am very much thinking more of like, oh, the ice, the ice caps are melting. It's over there, it's over there, it's not here, it's not at home. It's not happening to me again until like I say, it's October and 105 degrees. That's the only time I think about it. And I think it's important that we note that it does happen and that the people who, in my mind at least, are most at risk of dealing with the most severe consequences of it in the US are the people who are in detention centers, are the people who are in jails and are the people who are in prisons. Just like they're the most vulnerable population when it comes to COVID-19 because they can't social distance, they're the most at risk because they can't, they can't just go out and get resources to take care of themselves. They can't go and find a blanket. It has to be brought to them. They can't go and you know make space, um, air vents inside of their facility. They have to be moved to get where there's air circulating. Um, and these are very big problems that are in the system that we've already identified um, across the board. And so again, like I said, I will put up links for the carceral system and how weather has impacted people inside of that specifically. Um, impact on sensuality. Now, a lot of times when I hear gender sexuality, people are thinking specifically about um, the body and what are the names that we're gonna put on the body, right? Not necessarily how the body feels or how we connect with each other. Um, so, and I should have asked this earlier, I'm gonna talk very uh, plainly about sex. Is that cool with everybody? We good on that? Cool, great, all right. So one of the things that I have noticed for me in particular is that it's hard to go outside when the sun is out during the day to go work out, right? It's hot. In Texas, it is freaking hot and it's hot all the time. And we're seeing a lot of other states that aren't used to this kind of heat, you know, expressing the same things. 
when I don't go outside and work out, I am not necessarily feeling my best and my most confident in this body, which affects how I then relate to other people when they want to be intimate, right? I don't know um, if anyone else has seen the memes where it's like uh, the chick takes up a whole blanket and the guy takes, uh, you know, stuck without the blanket. Do we know that, that meme? Have you ever seen the memes where people are like, it's too hot to lay next to you? It's too hot to name. All of those things are being affected. I live in an apartment complex that has an air conditioner. Uh, central heating is available inside of this building. There are a lot of people who do not have that access. Uh, like when I lived in Chicago, they had to put an air conditioner inside of the window. Um, and what that means is people are less likely to be up on each other because it is so hot, right? If you're always constantly sweating, which means you're always constantly letting off a smell. I don't know who sweats and who doesn't have a smell. <laughs> We're talking about body functions, like how the body is literally impacted by the weather. When you're sweating, you have a smell. And if you're always smelling, that's gonna impact your relationships. Um, again, this is not very clear and I hope that it will be clear when I put the links to the conversation. Um, but there are several different theories that the heat is going to impact our ability to communicate well with others. It's going to impact our ability to calm down essentially, right? The seasons are very much attached to what happens in our bodies. I know that in some, um, in some femme bodies, there are, there's the menstrual cycle and our bodies are affected by the moon, right? That's not something we want it to do. It's just kind of up there and it's just kind of happening. Um, and it's the same thing for weather. When it's hot, 80% of the year, tensions are gonna be higher and people are gonna be more likely um, to argue and more likely to disengage from each other physically. And if they are engaging physically, it'll either be hypersexualized or it'll be hyperviolent. Right? Um, today, one of the first things that I questioned was when do, like, I'm going to try to figure this out. I don't know if there's been a study for it, but I would like to know how often uh, riots and uh, protesting happens in the winter months versus how often it happens in the summer months or how often it happens when there's heat available, right? Because tensions are always higher. Um, I'm wondering if there's like a correlation between the number of deaths that happen and the time of year, right? We know that people tend to, um, tend to have a harder time around the holidays, right? When it comes to self, but I, I'm really interested in how often do people um, interact with others in a negative way during the warmer months? Can it be correlated to the weather itself? And if, and if so, if we know that for the most part, things are going completely wrong, places that haven't had a winter, we had Texas and snow in the middle of the day, like two months ago. I don't like snow. <laughs> I avoid snow. I moved away from Chicago after being there for six months. And I was like, I loved everything about the summer. Could not stand it when it started snowing. Had to leave like this, right? Um, but the fact that it is snowing and not just in the north part of Texas, but further and further down, almost to the coast, that's, that's having to do with the climate crisis. That's not something um, that's planned or that's wanted. I'm gonna move away from the sensuality and go into artistry. Uh, since this is the thing that I know the most about, I'm not, I've been in the carceral system and I've experienced the carceral system and I've spent a lot of time studying it, but I am not a professional in the carceral system. Sensuality, I have a lot of theories, but not all the evidence to back up all of my personal theories, right? Um, all of those are my personal experiences and my personal examinations on the thing. On artistry, however, I do know a bit when it comes to, and when I say artistry, I don't mean just poetry. I mean performance. I mean um, visual art in all forms of visual art. So that includes paintings, that includes photography, that includes 
um, sculpture that includes multimedia projects, uh, video. Um, what we're seeing is that the weather is actually encouraging more artists to be out and about, right? There, it feels, and I, again, I could be exaggerating, but the, the growth of MFA programs, and when I say MFA, it's not just for English and poetry and fiction and all that fun stuff, but MFA is across the board. The growth of the arts industry and the, I would say the, guys, this is how I write. I say, I know a word, it's in my head, but it's not coming out very quickly. Um, how inundated the industry, the arts industry is with artists is kind of crazy. You can go to YouTube and find content creators for everything. Um, do we know what Scrivener is? Scrivener is a writing program <laughs> for dorks <laughs> who don't want to use Word anymore, who want fancy like tools and things like that. I am one of the said dorks um, who was like, I need something that'll help me count all my words without me having to go and click tools on my, right? I got Scrivener but I don't know how to use it. So I went to YouTube and I was like, who's gonna make a video about Scrivener? I found 25 videos about Scrivener, right? And to create those videos, you have to have a camera, you have to understand editing technique, you have to understand lighting, you have to understand marketing, right? You have to know how to do the, uh, the SOS, it's not SOS, what is it called when you do the specifics on the data? so that people can find the right things. Content, SEO, thank you. This is my regular day. I have a thesaurus that sits right next to my bed and Siri, and be like, Siri, what's that one word that describes that one thing? Um, SEO, but you have to, <laughs> oh, awesome. I'm gonna need to talk to you so I can learn how to do SEO <laughs> from a website. We gotta learn how to, SEO is a tool, right? Um, the most successful artist, and when I say successful in this context, I mean the artist who is able to sustain themselves as an artist. So I mean uh, the ability to pay your bills, the ability to get food, the ability, yes, yeah, Scrivener. It's, let me see what the, like it's Scrivener. It's spelled the, yeah, the, the first way. The way you spelled it the first way is the correct one. Yeah, it's a real, it's an app that you can pull down on your computer. Um, it does have a cost to it, but uh, I've just watched the video and learned how valuable it is. So I will be using it for my next couple of books. Um, but when I say successful artistry, I mean someone who is able to sustain themselves and pay their bills. Um, they're able to get medical help and assistance. Um, they have health care. They're able to uh, keep a roof over their head. They're able to get food. Um, and they are able to set aside money for emergencies, right? Um, successful artistry is hard and difficult, and most people will not get there. So there are a lot of people who are existing and working just off of the barest of tools and it's all about um, not necessarily just the constant content, but are you able to produce something that's profound in a very quick manner? It's the commercialization of artistry that's happening. And it is deeply impacted by the weather. If it is nice weather, it's so much easier to just be out there all the time, every day. Um, I find people who are able to do their videos and able to do their I'm specifically thinking of visual art. Visual art is a lot easier to do when the weather's great because you have to be out and about. You can't just do it from your home. You can, but viewers want constant movement. Um, people are making whole movies and putting them on YouTube. And I don't just mean YouTube. I mean, YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram. I had to remember what Instagram was called for a minute. Instagram. Um, all of those places, people are creating entire movies and entire segments. And most of those segments, if you watch on any given day, if you want to, if you spend a couple of hours on there, you'll see how many times people have to be outside, right? How many times they need natural lighting. There are so many videos on natural lighting and it has to do with like picking up the perfect time of day 
all those things. If it's cloudy day, it's actually better for a photographer if it's slightly cloudy than versus if it's super bright. And all of those things, the success of their business is dependent on what's happening outside and not just what's happening inside. Netflix's, uh, what is it? Netflix's uh, stock went up during the epidemic because of pandemic because of the pandemic, because people were inside, right? Now, if it had been directly impacted by weather, which there's an argument that, of course, COVID-19 is a byproduct somewhat of the weather. I'm not going to go into the crazy theories, <laughs> but there is theory that it is impacted by the weather and the way that we've abused this earth, and that's how uh, it came to fruition the way it is. But the pandemic, if it had been affected primarily by the weather outside, we would see all sorts of online entertainment, the pricing and the amount of money you can make going up, right? Which would lead to some success for people who are working in the industry. As far as writers, is everyone here a writer? Awesome. As far as writers, we don't really, um, our actual practice isn't necessarily too much impacted by the weather, right? The practice of writing, which is solitary, which does involve a lot of sitting inside of dark rooms, which I happen to be in one, which is why I have these two lights in my background cover because my room is very dark. Um, it's a lot of working from inside of a, a small place, but our work is also in a lot of ways impacted by the weather. And we're gonna, ex we're gonna explore how that happens. Um, there's this idea that poets are always connected to nature. Is that something that other people have heard or examined? Jericho Brown's cover of his latest collection is a black boy with flowers on his head sitting out in the garden, right? I think even uh, Fatima's book, somebody had Fatima's book, even on the cover there are flowers. Yeah. Um, even the poet that is the <laughs> Instagram poet, uh, Ruby Cower. Um, look, I'm not even. Go we're not making a. We're not making a judgment on Ruby Cower today. I'm not gonna go into to Ruby. What I will say is that Ruby makes a living, which is interesting, and it's not necessarily an indictment one way or the other. It's just kind of you make a living. I can't even knock it. I'm not making a living yet. Like, how, how do I get to where you at, but without having to negate what I think is um, artistry? Um, so there's this idea that poets are always, poets and writers of all kinds are connected to nature, and it's a recurring theme. Um, I happen to be a poet who loves nature and technology, and so I'm always trying to find ways to connect the technology to the work, uh, as well as the nature to the work. And now what we're gonna try to do is look at some poems that have been successful at connecting what's happening in the climate crisis with their work. And they're bridging the, they're bridging the conversation that's happening globally with what's happening internally, um, with what's happening with the weather. Practically speaking, the weather also impacts people coming out of shows, which very directly impacts the incomes and livelihoods of writers and artists, absolutely. Absolutely. Writers, and that's the next, and that's the next phase, right? Because right now what we're examining is what's happening in the room when you're by yourself doing the writing. And then we'll talk about like how it definitely does impact your ability to make a living outside of that room. Right? I don't assume that every writer wants to have their work be public and consumed by others. But if you do want your work to be public and consumed by others, it also somewhat requires that you are successful at doing so if you want to keep doing it all the time. If you don't want to do anything else. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to write. That's it. That's it. Just let me write and I'll be good, right? Um, but in order for me to do that, I have to do that, quote unquote, successfully. And by successfully, again, I mean the ability to live sustainably off of my art. Um, which means that other people have to like it. Other people have to buy it. Other people have to show up to the shows. They have to show up to the readings and buy the book when it's signed. They have to um, invest in my work overall. 
uh, which requires that I be quote unquote um, successful in my presentation of work. So let's get to poems and then we'll have um, some questions. I've talked your ear off in a jumble today. So yay, you're welcome. Speaking of Fatima, let's look at Fatima's piece here. As you can see, I am one of those people who have 20 million tabs. That's just how I roll. <laughs> all the time. It's like, here are all the online tabs and then here are all the, <laughs> the poems. So this is from uh, poets.org and I believe it's from if they, if, what did you, what is the name of the book? If they come for us. So uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and read this. I don't know what would kill us first, the race war or what we've done to the earth. So I count my hopes. The bumblebees are making a comeback. One snug tight in the purple flower I passed to get to you. Your favorite color is purple, but Princess was orange and we both find this hard to believe. Today the park is green. We take grass for granted. The leaves chuckle around us. Behind your head, a butterfly rests on a tree. It's been there our whole conversation. But my old apartment was a butterfly sanctuary where I would read and two little girls would sit next to me. You caught a butterfly once, but didn't know what to feed it. So you trapped it in a jar and gave it to a girl you liked. I asked if it died. You say you like to think it lived a long life. Yes, it lived a long life. So there are a couple of things we wanna note, right? The title. I am never going to, um, uh, I said never, and I'm just going to take that back. Um, at this time in my life as a writer and as a reader, I think the title is just as important as the rest of the piece, right? Because it will give you so much the information. Um, great poems, in my opinion, do this work. I don't know what will kill us first, the race war or what we've done to the earth. Now, the poet could have chosen uh, to just leave it at, I don't know what will kill us first, right? They could have done that. Um, they chose not to. I will also note that this entire title is capitalized for each word that needs to be capitalized, um, which is standard in the industry, um, but also a choice because titles don't have to be capitalized. If, they, if authors really don't want them to be, they don't have to be. Uh, but this is making a major statement. It's making, um, it's asking us a question. It's not just telling us something. It's asking us a question, what will kill us first? What would kill us first? And then it goes into the race war or what we've done to the earth. Now, um, I would say that there's nothing directly mentioning the race war, right? There's no real like, and here are the races that are battling against each other, none of, none of that. What we do get are several options for color inside of the poem, right? We get bumblebees, which is uh, yellow and black, right? We get a purple flower. We get the actual word color we get purple again. Princess, favorite color was orange. Um, the park is green. The butterfly doesn't necessarily give you a specific color, but it rests on the tree, which we also think of as like brown and green. Those are the colors that we get to it. Um, and then when's the next time we get a color really? No, that's it. That's where the colors officially end. Um, I can put my own reading into it and be like, oh, well this color automatically, a butterfly sanctuary automatically brings color to my mind, like all the colors. But I can't say that for certainty. What I can say there are several times where we get the color and we get it specifically at the first half of the poem, which mimics this statement, right? The race war, we, we look at color in the first half of the poem, which mimics the title and then on the second half of the poem, what we've done to the earth. And at this point, this is where we start talking about um, the butterfly being put into a jar, 
right? And I don't know what to feed it, but I'm gonna keep it in this jar. Which in this poem is, is a small violence, right? Um, I could very easily, if I wanted to go there, if I was like writing an essay about this poem, I could very easily go in and talk about how it kind of speaks to incarceration, right? Where people say, yeah, we should definitely put bad guys in jail and they should stay there if they've done something wrong, but you don't know if they've done something wrong or not. And they're just in there. And other people are like, oh, I like to believe that, you know, only bad guys stay in jail for a long time, but we know that's not the case, right? All of the facts, all of the data that's coming back to us is saying that a lot of innocent people stay in jail for a long time and some die in there. Um, but it, it, this poem kind of speaks to that, right? So it mimics, it mimics this here. You, if I was to read this off the front without like, you know, coming into the conversation with the context of climate, I wouldn't necessarily think of climate, but I would think of the earth and the land. And this is an example, and this, I took this directly from poets.org. I put in climate crisis, and this is one of the first poems that came up, right? And what it means is that when you write a poem that speaks to the earth and any changes in the earth, that speaks to climate crisis, the earth has always been changing. When we talk about crisis, we're talking about something that's detrimentally happening to the earth. And this is one of those things, a way in which we directly affect the earth in a negative way. We take the butterfly, we put them in a jar and we walk away. And that's directly speaking to the negative impact of humanity on the planet, right? So um, this is a quote from Fatima. I think about the ways that our world feels unsustainable. Some of the most pressing ways being the race war that always feels like it's boiling right under the surface and climate change disaster. This poem is about a day that I got lost in a conversation with a friend and it felt like things slowed down around me and I was able to put those fears aside and just appreciate what was around me and how hopeful that is, getting lost in the words and presence of someone you love, having them put a pause on the impending doom that seems right around the corner at all times, right? So the next piece I'm going to show you is I'm gonna, Camille Dungy. So Camille Dungy um, wrote, or well, was the editor of this anthology, which you cannot see because cameras. Ah, uh, ah, uh, crap. How do I make it work? What if I just put it on me? Can you see that? All right, Black Nature, <laughs> okay. Um, this book actually came out in, what year is this? It's very abused because it's moved with me to several apartments by this time. Um, 2009. So it's an anthology from 2009. It's um, primarily black writers speaking on nature. I am gonna try to photocopy some of these um, pages and stick them in the Google doc that I'm gonna send to you guys later. Um, but this speaks especially to the world and so we're going to take a look at Camille Dungy's poem. Camille Dungy, I think, has been an eco-poet for a long time. I didn't think of Camille as an eco-poet until, yeah, until the last couple of years. And I was like, that's what they were doing this whole entire time. All right, cool. I didn't have word for it because I didn't have the context for it. Um, and that happens when you're at a different point of your writing career where you start being able to put things into context. So characteristics of life. A fifth of animals without black bones could be at risk of extinction, says scientists, BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail and I will tell you I speak for the snail. Speak of under earthness, I connect. Speak of underneathness, and the welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water skeet, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant. I speak from time, I speak from the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly. I will tell you one thing today and another tomorrow. 
and I will be as consistent as anything alive on this earth. I move as the currents move with the breezes. What part of your nature drives you? You and your cubicle ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus and I will be silent as the Nautilus shelf on a shelf, shell on a shelf. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask of me. Ask me what I know of longing and I will speak of distances between meadows of night blooming flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly, you with the candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. So again, this is another poem that explains a lot with the, with the title, Characteristics of Life. Um, it's also very, the word's not arrogant, it's very matter of fact, right? I know what the characteristics of life are, um, which no one person can know all the characteristics of life, which is why we keep writing, which is why we keep creating. We're all asking different questions and getting us to different perspectives as we try to understand what the world means to us. Um, but I appreciate this line of questioning. And it happens several times in the poem. And it reminds me that um, there's cyclicalness to the world, right? So we got one, two, three, four. Four times that the poet says, ask me. Does anybody else see another one? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I only see, ask me if I speak four times in the poem. I just wanna make sure that no one else sees another one that I don't see. I only see four, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, there are supposed to be four seasons in the year, right? We don't have four seasons. But if this poem is claiming to speak to the characteristics of life, you would want to include four seasons. Now, if I'm a reader and I want to analyze this poem, I'm going to ask if I can find spring, if I can find winter, if I can find summer, if I can find fall. Um, if we had more time to just like go into all of that, I probably could, right? Just find the elements of that. Um, but the reoccurring question also speaks to the cycles, the currents move, where is it where they say? I filter and filter and filter all day, which is speaking to the waves that are also mentioned in this piece. If I can just find the waves, where'd they move to? I cannot find the waves. The life that springs up, I speak. I speak for the moment, one thing today, another tomorrow. I move as the currents move with the breezes. So maybe I just thought of waves when I saw currents move. Um, but it's important to know that repetition is connected to the earth as well, right? And any time that you can use a line in a poem to mimic natural occurrences in the world, like we just said, four times as they say, ask me, that can speak to seasons. Um, anytime that you do repetition, like I filter and filter and filter to mimic waves or to mimic um, something that's actually happening in the world currents. This is the first level of it, right? If the author wanted to do something speaking directly to the crisis itself, they can thin cut half of it, right? which would speak to a, a dynamic change. Something is no longer working. And so you set the president, ask me if I speak, ask me if I speak, ask me. I speak would be a different line, but like that would be one way to kind of break it in half and then go back into the ask me if I speak as one line. And so that's a tool, what I'm trying to show you is a tool that you can use when you're writing, if you want to speak directly to the climate crisis, one way is to incorporate 
the rhythms and the things that happen in the earth. Um, if you want to talk about a spider, which is a naturally occurring thing, it's not artificial, it's not, um, we don't have me mechanical spiders yet, I hope not. Um, we have mechanical dogs, but you start making mechanical sp spiders, we're going to have a problem. Um, but if you were to speak on a spider and the habits of a spider, we would talk about a web. We would probably use the number eight at some point in the poem. And when I say use the number eight, repeat something eight times. Or, you know, we would try to find a way to look at a spider and use a spider as the root of a form that can be created just like Jericho Brown's The Duplex, which is meant to mimic the actual duplex. It's meant to mimic the structure of a building. Uh, it's the same concept here when you're building a poem about the weather. Um, let me take a look at where we're supposed to be. Because I do want to give you guys a break. I don't want you guys to feel like you got to sit here for the whole time while I ramble. Um, before we take our break, which is going to be a five minute break, um, and when we come back, we're going to look at taking one line from one of the poems and one line from a headline, a current headline about the climate crisis. Uh, and then we're going to write about that for 10 minutes. And then we're going to take one seemingly unconnected current event and one climate event and connect those. All right. So we're going to do some writing in the next round. Um, after that break, we'll get to that. There is going to be a chance for you guys to read your own pieces, right? Hopefully take a line or two out of something that you already have with you and see how we might uh, examine it as a, as a related to the climate crisis. Um, but please go take five minutes to get your drinks, to breathe and be like, man, she's a rambler. Uh, <laughs> go, go take a minute, guys. If you are having a question about how these things are connected, there is a lot of information available to you. I do recommend the Marshall Project. Uh, the Marshall Project is uh, very informative. They do a lot of articles about the non-traditional ways in which people who are incarcerated are affected um, by global issues, which includes uh, climate change. And so when you go here, you can see there are a ton of articles and essays to pull from. Um, it's important to note that like, you know, things get updated. And uh, if you have a question, you should always research it, right? Don't just say, oh, the ice caps are melting without any form of reference. You can always look it up and see <laughs> why are the ice caps melting and how do they melt and what kind of materials are being used. I'm gonna take you guys on a little bit of a journey for one of the pieces. Um, this is my poem. Uh, Arco, which is the name of my next project. Uh, and what's important about this piece, I'm not even going to like show you all of the words, but it's the format. When you take a look at this photo in the background, which is not a photo that I chose, but a photo that is relevant to the conversation because I was writing in particular about this space. Um, you can see that there are mountains here and that they go up and they come down and they're very ridged. Not all the lines are perfect or straight. Um, that's the way of nature, but that's the way of this space in particular. There's even like a little uh, tiny, what I would call like where the water used to run through the buildings, right? I said buildings, through the mountains. Uh, you can see the paths kind of in the background. The shape of this palm is meant to mimic that. Just the shape. Like if there's, if there's any question, this is just the shape. I also called the poem Arco, uh, which is a way to say arc, the arcing of something. We're moving from one space to another space. And again, the poem mimics the title and it mimics the land. When it comes to line length, very, very long lines. When you're driving through the desert, in particular the Chihuahuan Desert, which is um, in between Texas and California, uh, the drive is long. If you're just driving straight through, it's just long. And so the lines are super long because they're mimicking the space. If I was driving through, um, trying to see, I think most people are at least understand Austin a little bit. Yeah. 
have, I, I'm hoping that some people have been to Zilker Park. If I'm driving through Zilker Park, there's probably going to be a lot less of this and a lot more of clean cut lines, probably a little bit more circular, right? It's going to be, it's going to look like it's, um, it's going to look more like a box because Zilker has natural space, but it's curated natural space, right? They've chosen how they want us to interact with that space. They've given us our paths through it. And so the shape of the poem would be different. Um, I'm just gonna read this first, this first uh, two deals here. In the desert, who I was evaporates in the belly of a long night. So in the very first line, I'm letting you know to think of the desert. I'm making you think of long night. And I say the word belly. Is it possible to zoom in a little bit more? Yeah. Um, uh, these are great questions. I think if you go to view um, at the top, uh huh, and then there should be a zoom zoom in thing. So um, I've never used this tool before. <laughs> oh man, thank you. I learned something today. <laughs> There's also, if you look at it, it has a, a little thing for a shortcut, so you can do like Command Plus, I think. So to do that faster if you want to in the future. That's crazy. <laughs> Never knew that. Thank you. Now I know. Okay. <laughs> now I know it's possible. All right. Um, so in the very first line, we mentioned the desert. So I'm trying to hint, even if you don't know, even if this picture didn't exist, uh, that we're going to be in a desert. And later I'll mention what kind of desert. So like here I mentioned desert. And by the time we get to Chihuahua and Tonger, like you should know what desert I'm like I'm talking about a desert. That's where this, that's the setting. And it's important, especially when you're talking about poems and climate crisis that you speak on the setting because not every part of the world is going to react to things the same way. I'm specifically engaging with um, floods that have been had in the South. I'm thinking of Louisiana's floods and some floods that were had throughout Texas. And I'm thinking in particular about California's um, burning constantly on fire right um in my mind at least that's the the poetic version of me is thinking california is always on fire um also happens to be my birthplace so i'm arcing those two stories in the desert who i was evaporates in the belly of a long night i've given you belly which the belly of the poem is empty right and long night um Everything, all the lines are long except for here in the belly. All right, so the shape of the poem is meant to interact with the subject of the poem directly. And I'm gonna give you guys some like time to like pull from a couple of headlines and pull a line from a poem that you're working on currently. Um, and I'm gonna try to help you figure out what the shape of that poem can be, right? How, it, how can it mimic whatever your subject matter is? Um, makes it difficult to know exactly when I became a valley, a facility of ghosts. Um, and when this line is in particular is about um, the valley in Texas and uh, detention centers, right? So there, there are so many ways that you can have the land and have climate enter into the conversation. I'm trying to think of a line that's specifically about weather. Um, turning back to watch everything in California burn. A specific to California is mostly in the first half of the poem and the second half of the poem uh, is when we get to Texas. And this is what I would actually say an early version of the poem. I printed and got published an early version of the poem because the poem isn't finished. There's gonna be more to this poem. If I really wanna emulate the desert, it's gonna be a long uh, ass poem. This is gonna be a long ass poem. Um, but that's also to let you know that you do not have to publish only the finished part. If you got a really good thing working, go ahead and let it roll. Um, now this part, sweating blades of brome grass, sleeping in puddles of hushing grandma, my legs dangling from a bed of dehydrated moons. Now I tried to think about uh, in particular the land between Mexico and Texas 
um, and what the what the journey was from Mexico to Texas when people are coming over the border and what the land looks like as they're crossing. I didn't know what grown grass was or grandma, so I had to go find that out. And it was as simple as Googling, what desert do I live in? What is the, the native plant and the native uh, bush and the native grass? What are all these things called? And then, I'm, I, and then I went and looked, okay, well, how does, it, how does it move? How is it affected by space and by time? Um, I'm gonna show you one that is not completely finished. Um, if it'll let me show you. So this is a new poem that has not been published anywhere, but that is also working to do some of the same work. Or said so working to do some of the same work, duh. Um, <laughs> wants to do some of the same work. It's about Susana Chavez, who was murdered in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and I'm trying to talk again about the connection of what happened in Ciudad Juarez to what's happening right now, last night, um, in the last several days when it comes to the protesting and the riots. Um, and it's specifically being created to incorporate the land. I wanted to pay attention to this line, which may or may not change, right? The lavender orchid vine survives into the low 20s. It can recover even if frozen to the ground. That is an actual plant and that is an actual line from an actual document discussing in a very long, boring essay <laughs> how uh, the land, how what like native flowers do when it's cold in the desert. Because that's what I was trying to figure out. I was like, what does it look like? What, what are the native plants and how do they live in the different weather um, that's happening? And so this one was something I didn't know. I didn't know that the desert could get into the low 20s, you know, at a regular time. And I didn't know that lavender orchids could survive that. I also want to understand how movement happens. So burn the fields and bring the crops. Um, a lot of people don't know, at least I didn't know, that you have to burn the field sometimes in order to make it better for uh for plants to grow that's very interesting because technically we are burning down things to make them change uh in society right and so that's a conversation that i'm trying to have in those poems and now it's time to talk about your poems so um i am going to pick a headline and does everybody have a poem that they're working with that, that they've brought that the, that's their own poem? No? Okay. Um, do you want a random line for me to find for you? Um, I might be able to choose a line from like some, some like, like very beginnings of poems, but I have to look through. Yeah. Just pick one line and let's take a look and see if we can find a, a stop sharing by accident. Let us try to find a headline. Now we're just going to find, I'm literally just going to Google see what we get. One of the poems um, that is coming out very soon in American Poetry Review is from a headline that I did this. I just picked a headline and it was one that felt strong enough. I read the story on it. Um, let's do, uh, give me a good headline. Okay, let, let's, yeah, let's do this one. Climate crisis making worlds forests shorter and younger. Study finds, right? So I want you to take one line from your poem Started on the new document. I'm going to show you guys what I mean by that. I'm just going to give me a new document. Okay. Bro. I'm just going to come up with a line. Um, All right, that's my line. 
just it's not in anything I've written. It's just a line I just came up with right now. What I have given is more than enough. Climate crisis. So when you see a headline like this, it's kind of interesting, mostly because of the juxtaposition of crisis and shorter and younger, which anyone who is, anyone who lives, I think at some point questions, when did I get so old, right? We all want to be younger. Um, I don't know about shorter, but <laughs> I think that at some point, a lot of people want to be younger. At least I feel that coming on strongly. Um, I was like, okay, my head is half great. I wanna be younger. I think it's interesting that climate crisis is making for shorter and younger. Um, and what does that say about society that we want to be younger, but that it's a crisis when it's happening to the forests, right? So you could take out just the word crisis and make that a line. So you can make a line in relation to what I, what I have given is more than enough. We are past the crisis. And I'm just doing this very quickly for you um, because obviously when you have more time to think about it, you'll be able to be more intuitive about um, how to build off of these things. I think that uh, shorter and younger is a line. I think study finds is a line. And I think that um, forced is a line. So take the context of the line that's already yours and have a conversation with one of these here or all of these. Okay. To even go more into depth, um, I'm gonna link, put this link in the chat. And if you wanna take a minute or two, because you know I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. If you wanna take a minute or two to just kind of quickly graze through the article. When you do this practice on your own, I do encourage that you take your time and research the article, right? Don't just take this article's word for it. Please look at all the different articles. Um, but just take, take a time to look through it and see how, ask yourself, is there anything in this article that I feel directly connected to in one way or another? Um, I can think about increases tree, tree deaths by limiting photosynthesis and causing stress, right? I automatically, again, am thinking about the protests that are happening right now. So my line is probably gonna connect with this. I can connect tree deaths and limiting light, which is what photosynthesis is, and limiting light and causing stress. I can relate that to what I'm going to write about right off the back. And that's my personal experience. But take a look, take a gander, and don't take too much time because this is just a generative exercise that you can explore more in depth at a later date. As soon as I can figure out how to get the chat on, how do I? Do the chat thing. It never fails. Where is? Okay, directions. Anyone? Where is the chat? Is it hiding from me? Yep, it is hiding from me. There it goes. And then how do I? I'm just gonna click and paste. Jeez. Oh, you guys have to forgive me. I haven't mastered my. my Mac yet. There it goes. All right, let's go ahead and take 10 minutes. I'm sorry I didn't give you the one minute, two minute markers. But if we want to start coming back. How was that? It was awesome. Like, I haven't written a ton lately, but I just, I got really excited with this because I found, I found an article that just, that was called, it was something like, planting trees is great, but it's not enough. 
um and um like I think a lot of people who know me know that I I'm always thinking about disability and disabled people and one thing I I messaged this to KB earlier in the chat but I was like when you were talking about sensuality um it made me think of because I can think of so many ways that like disability and disabled people are impacted by the climate crisis but I thought of another way when you were talking about that and that was like that there are so many people who are sensitive to temperature and not just like you know like oh no this sucks but like like if I if it's too hot outside I will faint right um and so like changes in temperature extreme cold extreme heat can really exacerbate the painful parts of people's disabilities um and um I also like think a lot about how disabled people are sort of like blamed in a lot of ways for the climate crisis when like they're not like they're just like for example like the whole straw thing where disabled people were like there are a lot of disabled people who need the plastic straws but they were blamed for the climate crisis when it's like in reality right no one's putting in any of the effort to like make the tech that is both good for the planet and good for people and you're blaming the people who need it instead of the people like who right. are mass producing straws right um but is it okay to share what i wrote so far yes this is that time great um so i didn't like write everything i wanted i have so many things in my head but i put some stuff down and i really like it so far um okay planting trees is great but it's not enough is my working title for excellent off the top of my head from what you're reading the places that might be interesting to play with as far as structure like mm -hmm. the visual structure uh you mentioned fracture twice yeah so fracturing in some way or form um you also mentioned the word rings twice um we don't have enough time to go into like how lines can be broken or the efficacy of you know breaking a line and what extra work it can do but mm -hmm. i would consider the rings making that a cyclical phrase that happens throughout the piece right yeah. and that that would come later in editing once you've been able to get a lot of that emotion in there but uh even the droplets part would be a fun way like how could you how could you have a poem that looks like it's trying to do traditional structure and then drop it so that it doesn't necessarily yeah do, um i'm not those are some ideas that's awesome thank you i really i really appreciate it no thank you for sharing your piece i can oh. share oh excellent yes um i have it in my notes app but i'm on my phone right now so uh, my video won't be on while i'm reading uh but this is called incubation what i have given you is more than enough but i could still offer you this a quiet day when the crisis is past or is passing a memory of what it meant to have short well-mannered summers a younger festering love a forest of our well wishes deeply embedded beneath our shame remember when i studied your wrist for hours grazing for hints about how many wives you would take how many children you would eat how many days you would stay in my bed um and so this is turning into a a very <laughs> very sad poem about my very first boyfriend who was not a nice person at all um but that's also um and there are yeah there absolutely are different ways one thing i did want to point out here and this is always a fun thing to think about um is grazing for hints about how many wives you would take how many children you would eat how many days you would stay in bed how many wives you would take okay that's kind of somewhat normal right to think about in a society where divorce is normal that you might take more than one um how many days you would stay in bed that's also another normal thing but in between there is how many children you would eat right and this kind of stuck between two um regular things Right. As I continue to play with this form and continue to play with the lines, I'll start asking myself, what are some other things that seemed normal then that would not be normal? Um, 
if I were in the same relationship today, right? So uh, the, this line, if I continue to work on it um, on a personal note, this would be about my decision to not have children, right? And I would talk into like what it means to, I did not want to have children, but I'm a birth parent, which means I did give birth to a biological child that is now adopted by my friends. Um, they are her parents. Uh, but that guilt of carrying a child and bringing them into a world where they will be harmed by others on a regular basis because they are femme, they are black, and they live in the south side of Chicago, right? That constant concern and this root being my, the root of a lot of that being my first relationship ever, right? That fear that comes to that. So those are the crisis isn't just what's happening in nature. The crisis is internal as well, right? And so it's, I think when you're building pieces, um, it's good to kind of remind yourself of how is my life mirrored by what's happening in the world? Um, I'm going to show you guys one more piece and then give you guys, oh, wow, we're so at the end. Okay. Um, I don't want to disrespect your time. I did want to show you one last piece. If it would let me, oh, that was the email I needed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hold on, I can get it up. Um, the the piece is a piece that is going to be an American. Um, was that the one I was going for? I think it's this one. No, no, yeah, yeah, it's this one. It took me a second. All right, so this is going to be an American Portrait Review. Um, but this poem in particular was written after I read the headlines about um, the Alan Curdy, who was the two-year-old boy who was found face down on a beach after um, trying to come over with his family. Um, it's also about uh, the Angie and Oscar Ramirez as they were trying to cross the border to come into the U.S. Both of them were coming into the U.S. I found an article about a fish. <laughs> Um, so fish, let's say new fish from Curtis at new fish. Nope. Come on. Interwebs. Fish Curtiston. I don't know a lot about Curtiston, uh, but that is where, uh, Alan Curdy is from, hence the last name. Um, and I just was trying to find out, I was just trying to find out about Alan Curdy himself and an article popped up about this fish that came out of the ground. Um, no eyes. And it's this weird little pink fish. That's it right there. It's this weird, ugly little pink fish, right? Um, which happened to be similar in tone, uh, skin tone to Alan Curdy and to Oscar Ramirez and his daughter, right? And it's very interesting to me because in nature, this fish was found uh, very close to when they found Alan Curdy, which is where I got this poem. All right, so I just wanted to show you an example of how you will be surprised how much nature and what's happening in the climate crisis will show up in poetry. As you can see, I got some notes on there that I had to proofs. Um, it's called Foreign Bodies, the name might change, uh, but you cannot tell me there is nothing wrong with the weather. Scientists discovered a new species of blind, flesh-toned fish flushed out from a hole in the earth of Kurdistan almost an exact year after a photographer discovered the pronate body of Alan Kurdi flushed out from a hole in the earth of Turkey. Almost four years before a journalist discovered the pronate bodies of Oscar Ramirez and Angie Valeria flushed out from a hole in the earth of Texas this past Sunday. The origins of this new species of fish are widely speculated, essentially unknown, but it is clear they are proliferating underground. So this is just basic research, right? It's pretty much a statement of, it's a, it's a questioning statement. Like you find the body of Alan Curdy face down and then the very similar pictures of Oscar Ramirez and Angie Valeria face down. And then this weird fish pops up in Kurdistan. It has no eyes. Um, it's flesh toned and it's never been found before. Like they just had, they had never seen anything like it. 
And the fact that it came in between those two was something that I thought was a very interesting thing. When I say the origins of this new species of fish are widely speculated, essentially unknown, um, it's also speaking to the nature of people who are trying to cross the border to get into the US um, and how we don't know how many of them are trying to come in or how long they've been trying to come in. We don't know how many people have died in the desert or died in the water on their way here. Um, and so it's, it's again, essentially, it's speculated how many people, but it's unknown. And the rest of the poem does that. Uh, it'll be out, I think, in July, um, where I try to blend what's happening in the real world to what's happening. I talked about the fires of Paradise, um, Paradise, California. Um, I talk about some of the flooding. I talk about um, Greenland melting. Greenland is melting the yellow mix yellow milk swished from its mouth out into the ocean is enough to feed the world's hungry with salt and suspended silt. That is also from a headline of an actual article that's talking about Greenland melting. <laughs> so like there are so many ways that you can connect what's happening in the natural world to what's happening socially and what's happening internally, right? Um, don't be afraid to make those, those jumps logically. Um, sometimes, even in this, it says, the fires of paradise smokes out, should subject and verb agree? I disagreed with that particular edi editorial note, and I wrote a whole, like, you know, reason of why a fire can smoke out. Um, but, like, if you're going to make a, a, a jump that doesn't seem intuitive to other people, be willing to explain it or to share why you made that jump. Um, for some people, they don't like the word form bodies. And so that's uh, something I've been dealing with internally. Like, do I really want to call this form bodies? Or do I want to say people? Or, you know, what am I trying to say? But I am talking specifically about both fish and people. I am talking about the land and humanity. And that's where, like, you know, it's okay to make the jumps. Just if you're going to make the jumps, be willing to have a discussion about why you're making those jumps and make sure that while you're writing it, you also know what you're talking about, right? You have to know what you're talking. If it's pretty awesome, but know what you're talking about, right? Just be able to point back and say, look, this is where it started. And this is the line and trajectory I took to get here. So I wish we had had a little bit more time. I was trying to give you guys a lot of information very quickly. Um, we have reached the end officially of the workshop, but I want to take a moment to just answer any questions that you guys have. I'm going to have this document that I'm going to give to you so that you guys um, will be able to access it and just kind of look at some of the links and poems and things like that. I just need some more time to work on that. Um, Echo Tone is your friend. Frontier Poetry is great because they do care about Echo Tone, Frontier Poetry um, are very much about eco poetry. So that would be a great connect. I do know that Ecotone pays, I think a hundred to two hundred dollars per poem. Um, I'm pretty sure it's two hundred dollars. I just don't want to lie to you. It might be a hundred to two hundred, but that's still a lot for a poem. Um, Frontier Poetry is fifty dollars for a poem. Borderlands Texas Poetry Review. I'm the editor in chief. I do not have any money for you yet. We are working on that. It's going to take a little time in fundraising. So we give you an issue. Uh, Barrio Writers is a collect, uh, collective in Austin. And there are a ton more of resources like Austin Interfaces. They offer more resources for you. So um, are there any questions I can answer for you? Ooh. Also just know, just a short interjection. Just know that um, we are literally talking again in like 30 minutes. So if you want to like save your questions for them, that's also cool. Um, but thank you so much, Paylita. Um, I want to like be respectful of everybody's time and stuff. But I did want to share a couple of things with you today. Um, if you like this, um, leave an eval. If you didn't like it, leave an eval. Us at Interfaces are always about like hearing from community as to how our programming can be better. Because um, no one gets to a like supreme level of wokeness or programming to where it's like, I can put on any program ever. So we recognize that. And we like to um, uphold our mission through listening to our community. 
Um, if you'd like to RSVP for the next Artist on event, not necessary. Honestly, it's in 30 minutes. If you want to just literally rejoin using the same link, we're using the same link for all of our programs. Um, in that, um, all of the panelists, including Felita and Althea and um, Soups, we're going to talk about how climate change and sustainability informs our artistic practice. And it'll be a lot of time for questions there. If you wanna pay Felita for their amazing labor um, for this workshop and their amazing poetry, uh, Felita Hicks, Cash App, Felita Hicks 9, Venmo there. Um, we have another program called the Artist Showcase Open Mic. Also that happens once a month, every second Wednesday from seven to 9 p.m. Um, if you're interested in seeing performances, um, from different poets in the Austin area. Please, uh, poets, musicians, sorry, comedians, storytellers, we've had like lots of different folks. Um, please come out for that. Also, we have an open mic portion, so if you wanna read what you just wrote today, um, you totally can during our open mic. Um, uh, this is a volunteer run um, initiative. If you ever wanna donate to our cause so things like this can keep happening, please do sign up for our newsletter if you would like to know all of our upcoming events. Also similar events happening in Austin. Also, we have this cutesy little feature called Artists of the Month, as well as educational resources. Please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, follow us on Instagram, that's where we be, we be lit or whatever. Um, follow us on Facebook also if you wanna see um, upcoming events. Um, so I've done my mandatory spiel, y'all. This has been mad cute. I'm so happy to see y'all. Um, hope to see y'all in 30 minutes, but if not, please stay safe, please stay well, please log off if you need to. Um, please um, do your meditation practices, drink water, and all of the good things. Um, and we will see you next time. And know that if no one has told you today, I care about you and I care about your well-being.